Welcome to the Writing Gym Podcast. We're here to pump up your writing. And now your host, Andy Brixey, personal trainer at the Writing Gym. Hey there, writers and muse daters. I am really excited about today's episode. Not only will you get the scoop, it's the first time that he's announced it, on Brandon Webb's newest book, you'll also get tips on how to change your interior dialogue and get into the right relationship with your inner critic. Those are fabulous tips, but what I am most excited about in this episode is that Brandon shares so much of the philosophy of the way that we work with writers in the writing gym, helping them to see what's working and getting them through their goals with competence and confidence. I know you're going to love this episode. So here's the writing gym's resident writing coach, Annalisa Parent, interviewing New York Times best-selling author, Brandon Webb. Well, hello, Brandon. I am so happy to be speaking with you about your book, uh, Mastering Fear, which you co-authored with John David Mann. I'm really interested, you know, this is obviously a writing podcast. We talk with a lot of prominent authors. John's been on the podcast several times, uh, and he and Bob Berg have talked about how they work together to co-author a book. I'm really interested to hear what your process was with John to co-author a book, because that's a really interesting process. It's different than writing your own book. Yeah, you know, John and I work, we work extremely well together. I, I gotta say, I mean, we've done eight or nine books together. I, I lost count. <laughs> Yeah, him and I have worked multiple, multiple ways. Like we don't have a set format. Um, when he, when I was first introduced to John back in 2011 by my agent, Margaret McBride, she, I had turned in a pretty much finished manuscript for the Red Circle. And she said, hey, look, this is really good. But I think, you know, especially because it's a memoir, having somebody else ask questions and dig stuff out of you that you probably think is boring, but other people would find interesting. And so I took Margaret's advice. I met John and she was right. Like it not only, I mean, John is on his own and an incredible writer. He, he makes everything I do better. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's just a good kind of right hand man in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, but in that case, I gave him, you know, 80,000 words and he just rewrote and then made questions um, and really captured my voice uh, perfectly. And so that, that was the red circle. Uh, Then for uh, Among Heroes, for example, was a book about me like losing uh, friends and comrades and kind of dealing with that. Uh, But also, um, as a way to honor their memory, like I was, you know, John and I, our big struggle there was how do we, how do we write a book about four guys dying that's positive, right? And not, not make it a downer. Uh, and so we focused on kind of the, the good pieces of um, the friendship that I took away and, and how that made me a better person mm. and kind of highlighted those traits for other people to, to kind of, um, identify with as well. In, in that book, John and I worked, um, I set up the interviews with the families. So we would like co-interview a lot of the family members. John would, John would record our conversations and then he went in and wrote that book. Um, and usually I like to, I like to outline uh, the story arc. Um, and, and then in another case, John and I would kind of riff off each other. Um, I just, I spent uh, four and a half years chipping away at a novel that we're just about to finish together. I, I finally, this year, I said, John, I'm, I'm like 60,000 words into this thing and I just want to get it finished. It, it's, it's a novel, um, the working title is Steel Fear. And it's about a serial killer on an aircraft carrier. Um, it's based on true events. When I was a search and rescue swimmer, 
uh, in helicopters before I became a SEAL. Uh, I, was, I was deployed on the Abraham Lincoln, which is this massive nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, like almost 6,000 people on board. And they had just integrated women onto the ship um, and had a sexual predator on the boat. He assaulted, I think, seven or eight women, and they never caught the guy. Oh, boy. Like, it just... For people that never served on an aircraft carrier, even though it's a city, it has a, a police force, but these are really more like security guards. They're really not equipped to deal with, with like, you know, complicated crime. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a case of it, right? Like here, how, how does a guy who's using the same MO just like go to the woman's shower and assault seven, seven or eight women and not get caught? Like it's crazy. Wow. Um, and it created like terror on the ship. These women were terrified to shower. They were like showering in partners. Um, and so that, you know, the example, again, it, this was an example of John, how John and I worked together, right? I just dumped this manuscript on him and said, please help me finish. Um, and he made, he's made the characters more, he, he didn't change any characters, but he just made them more complicated and wrote these profiles and, um, I think it's going to be a great book and I'm, I'm happy like John and I will, will share equal, equal credit for that one. And that a novel writing a novel is very different than nonfiction. I can write nonfiction in my sleep just about, I mean, I, I started my business um, out of the blog space and my first website I launched in 2012. I mean, I must've wrote two articles a day for almost two years. So um, you know, you get good at, at writing after a while that way. Um, but yeah, John and I, you know, we work, uh, you know, we don't have this like set formula. Um, we've done over the phone. I've written, he's given me stuff back. I'll, I'll, that I'll smooth over. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times John, John counts on me for a lot of the technical details, um, that he just doesn't have the background for um and actually another project i'll i'll share with you I, I haven't really shared this with anybody uh on this at least on the podcast world um, i i wanted to explore other areas of fiction and i i had a i got an mba student do a study on the most underserved markets in fiction and it came back like military romance was like a huge underserved category. Uh, so I sold a project to St. Martin's Press, a three book romance deal. Um, and I directed the book. Like I basically directed a, a romance writer. Um, the book is called The Military Wife. It publishes in February. Oh, uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting because when I, I did that study, um, and had, I was hoping it would come back with like special ops in space, you know, <laughs> I was like, Oh, that'll be great. I was like, military romance. Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> ironically, my mom named me after a romance book, um, called the flame and the flower it was some pirate captain in the book. Um, and here I am like directing this romance series, but I, I it was funny because when the report came back, I was getting hit up on social media by all these established um, woman authors that were trying to break into this space, but they didn't have the background. They were asking me questions about training, how long is boot camp, what's Navy SEAL like, what's the structure? And I was like, oh, they're, they're trying to like, they're probably getting pressure for this type of content because they know, the publishers know that there's a gap. Um, but anyway, I'm excited about that series. Um, and again, I, I worked with the writer and just directed. I, I said, here's the story arc. Here's all the kind of juicy details, some real world experiences to go nuts. And, and she mm. did a great job. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I'm excited. About that. I, I just like to create stuff, I think is what it comes down to. Um, I don't mind sharing credit where credit is due. Yeah, well, and that's really beautiful. And you know, John is a, certainly a great partner to have, right? Um, 
So I want to get into the content of your newest book with John David Mann, uh, Mastering Fear, a Navy SEAL's Guide, and talk a little bit about the content because there's a lot of overlap between what you're presenting here and how we work with writers, and I thought that was really fascinating. Um, so it, over in the writing gym, we also talk about changing your interior dialogue is the phrase that you use. We say uh, getting into right relationship with the inner critic. So tell me more about changing your interior dialogue and what that means for you uh, and how you talk about it in the book. Uh, yeah, and, and I'll, so I think self-talk is a, is a big thing, right? It's, we have these, we walk around having these conversations with ourselves and not always for the they're not always positive to our benefit, right? And we, we say, oh, I'm not good enough for this. I'm not good enough for that. Um, and, it, and an example I would give you, um, you know, I remember I was, um, what was it? I was dating a girl and she made a comment, um, not, not to me, it was actually to my mom. And you know, I had had a couple New York Times bestsellers with John and she's like, oh, well, Brandon, you know, Brandon's never written on his own, a New York Times bestseller. And that really like stuck in my head. And I started having this conversation and I was like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough, right? <laughs> maybe I can't make it on my own. Um, but I, you really have, and that's like a perfect example of how you can kind of get stuck in that loop. Um, and then you know, fortunately, I, I was like, no, I, you know, I have what it takes. And then a couple of years later, I wrote a book with Jack Murphy. Um, in this case, Jack is an amazing writer. He runs our, the news site, um, part of my media company, uh, News Rep is what the site is called now. Uh, Jack is a brilliant writer. Him and I, in that case, him and I just said, hey, I'm going to take six chapters you take six we write it we had an editor copy editor redo it and, and then we wrote about the whole benghazi uh, event because we had like a lot of insider access and and that made the new york times list as a non-fiction ebook which is really tough mm -hmm. to, to make as an ebook mm -hmm. um but i had to change that conversation in my head that i'm not good enough right because if you let that affect you it's, it can really do damage um, to your career, to relationships. Um, I, the first time I learned the importance of self-talk was when I was in the military. Uh, I was about to take over the sniper program as course manager. Uh, we were running a pilot program to overhaul the SEAL, the Navy SEAL sniper course. It, it was a mediocre course before excuse me, before 2001, after 9-11, uh, we had budget to overhaul. And, and we said, well, how do we make this into one of the most premier courses in the world? Um, so we got, we were able to kind of bring in all these consultants. One of, one of them was, a, uh, who was a close friend of mine today is Lanny Basham. Lanny is a gold medalist and really was a pioneer in, in mental management for athletics um, in the 70s because he, he had went expected to win gold um, in his, his um, he was a competitive shooter, um, was, a, was a world champion, went to the Olympics in Germany, won silver because he let a couple Russian guys get into his head on the bus to the final event, um, came back. At, at the time, the, the sports psychology world was just focused on, they weren't focused on performance. They, they told everyone Lanny went to said, Oh, it's okay. We're going to make you okay with being number two in the world. And he's like, no, that's, that's not what I'm after here. I got to like, you know, something happened to me in, in my like self image, my self talk, I, I need to figure out what this is. And so what Lanny did was go to all the gold medalists and interview them, anyone he could get a hold of. Um, and he was an Olympic team member. So he, he ended up interviewing, I think, over 100 gold medalists and found, like, fundamentally, they all had certain similar characteristics and traits. They all had positive self-talk. They would write these mantras on sticky pads. Um, they would, their attitude in the face, like, they wanted and welcomed the competition. They knew that the competition was necessary 
to stimulate them to a level of performance that that doesn't come in practice, right? Like nobody breaks world records in practice. It just doesn't happen. You need that competitive environment or, or the stressors of the situation, right? Like think about public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, you know, I, when I started public speaking, it's, it's nerve wracking and it's, I think it's, you know, one of the biggest fears people have. Once you do it enough times, you realize, oh, this feeling, it's just, you can harness this nervous energy and fear to, to kind of make you elevate your, your performance um, to a higher level. Um, so I, I met this guy, Lanny, um, you know, I could talk for hours on, on what he did with us, but the, the short version is he gave us this incredible toolkit to, to use um, on how we train snipers, uh, self-talk, visualization, like visualizing, um, you know, performance, or even if you're nervous, uh, say you're giving a talk for the first time in public, uh, you could close your eyes and imagine yourself being nervous and sweating and kind of giving that sp speech over and over and over again. And, and your brain doesn't know the difference between reality and, and you just practicing in your head. You can train yourself to get better in, um, in, that, in that, those types of situations. Um, and, and so uh, we applied this to our sniper students. And the big thing Lanny said also, he said, look, you guys are, he's like, there's a time and a place for negative teaching style. Like, for instance, you know, maybe it's a tough financial internship. Like I know those guys get treated like you know, men and women that go to Goldman Sachs, right? Like if they're put into this negative environment to just see how they react and if they're able to overcome the same way as a, as a Navy SEAL training candidate, very negative environment. You know, they're talking down to you um, daily, um, but they want to see, do you have what it takes up here to deal with that? Um, but in, in the case where, you know, there's certain instances like for sure kids learning subjects in school, beginners and, you know, kids in sports, uh, even as an adult, like if you're like, I just recently took my first dance class um, and the instructor is great. It's a very positive environment. You know, if he was yelling at me, telling me I sucked and <laughs> I have two left feet, like that would be not a very, I, I wouldn't learn as fast in, in that environment. Mm -hmm. the same thing when we were teaching snipers, we were, we were, we had a very negative attitude and teaching style. And Lanny said, "Time out, guys! Like, there's no need for this style of teaching. You you need to switch to positive. Don't point out the mistakes that these guys are making. Just tell them the the positive, uh, corrective things that they need to do properly. Because when you're pointing out mistakes, let's say if someone's beginning to write." Um, and you're just hammering on all the mistakes they're making instead of saying, hey, this is what you need to fix it. You need to, you know, grammatically or, or structurally uh, move things around. You just tell them what to do properly because a, a beginner in those situations are sponges. And if you're pointing out the mistakes, you're programming them for bad habits is what it boils down to. So we changed from negative to positive teaching style. We implemented visualization techniques, all this stuff. Um, from Lanny and a bunch of consultants. And overnight we took, we had a, a course that was failing over 30% of the sniper students. And we, we started passing everybody. And the standards even got more difficult. Mm. Um, and so to me, that was the first time I, was, I experienced like positive psychology in action. I was like blown away. I said, this is crazy and it, and it works. Uh, and you know, I've applied it multiple times. You know, when I got, I went through a, you know, to me it was a pretty traumatic divorce. I mean, going from a dad coaching Little League and then, you know, divorcing my wife and she took the kids away to her parents out of, out of county. Um, it was very tough because I had to change the style of parent I was. I was no longer the kind of, you know, the father that could coach little league and see the kids on a daily basis. So, and, and on top of that, I just lost my first business and all my life savings. Like it was, it was a tough period in my life, but I, I caught myself going negative and said, well, wait a minute, I need to focus on the positive here. Like for one, thankfully, um, you know, my ex-wife and I were getting along. Like we chose to, to really work hard. Uh, for the kids' sake, 
to get along and have a good divorce. And I, st- I looked at, you know, okay, I lost my life savings and my first business, but I, I basically had this, um, I had two years, I put myself through business school. I had the, like a, a real world business MBA, like doing my first business, raising money. Um, so I had all these valuable tools that I could use to either buy a business or start another one. Um, and so I started focusing on the, the positive self-talk in my head um, to, to finish your very, uh, very long answer to your question about self-talk. Um, but that's, it's just so important because if I had got caught up in this thing like, oh, I'm, I failed, um, I'm a failure and, and then not started again, I would not have my business today. You know, I, I have a, a great media e-commerce business that employs 100 people today. Um, and I would not have had it had I fallen into this negative self-talk. And, and I see people do it in relationships all the time as well. Like I've, I have friends that are successful in other areas of their life, but they can't, they can't let go of certain things. And I talk about in the book, the, the coconut story, right? Where, right. you know, these, these monkeys in the jungle, they trap them by digging a hole in the ground with spikes and they put a coconut in there and the monkey reaches in, he grabs the coconut with both arms and he tries to pull it out, but he, the sticks are preventing his arms from coming out. All he has to do is let go of the coconut and he can run away. Um, but they don't, they just hold on to this coconut. And that's, I see people with their own version of coconuts, you know, relationships where maybe they've been, you know, cheated on or, um, had a bad experience. Maybe there's like mental abuse, physical abuse, and then they just can't let that go. And they're just bringing it into a new relationship. And a lot of times they, they just attract the same people because they can't, I tell you, I've been on enough bad first dates <laughs> living in New York City. Um, I can sense the negative immediately, and people in in a very good place in their lives sense that and run for the hills when they see it. Like I've, I can see it over and over in business as well. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, sorry to go on on and no, on. No, that's a, that's all really good information, and I'm so glad that you brought that up, Brendan, because the work that we do in the writing gym is based on neuroscience. And it's really interesting as you talk about positive psychology, there's a direct correlation uh, to the application of neuroscience to how we learn and create best. So you're absolutely right. In the writing gym, we're really focusing on, on the positive when it's time to really focus on the positive and bringing in that critical eye only when it's time to bring in that critical eye and bring that manuscript uh, to absolutely publishable and i'm sure you know all about what that process looks like having been through it several times now yeah Um, yeah and and again i see some writers um they get into this you know maybe it's it's like i mean it's hard to chase perfection right it's it's never as good as you hope it's going to be um and then you've got to realize you know depending especially in the world of books um you've got to realize that there's people that are that have good input right your your editor hopefully you have a good one at a publishing house is going to want to give input to the manuscript Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes structurally sometimes it's like hey stuff is missing Um, i think you could do more work here so i think people get hung up and they're like oh i don't want to turn it in yet i'm like I was like, you turn it in, it's going to get chopped anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so well, don't you let, publish it until it's finished, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't let, at some point. You know, perfection get in the way of good enough, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've never gotten to ask this question before. Andy always gets to ask this question. So I'm kind of excited. This is a big moment. But um, if you had one piece of advice to give the aspiring writer, what would it be? the aspiring writer i would i would say there's no substitute for for practice so i would definitely and and learning right like we're always learning i i read uh, stephen king's on writing book because i'd never written never written fiction before and it was a huge eye-opener for me 
because it was totally against my method of writing nonfiction where I create a story arc and an outline and I write to that. Um, um, so I would say, you know, practice, practice, practice and, and continually, you know, learn, like listen to podcasts like, like yours, um, read books, talk to other writers and just work on the work on the craft because it, you can't, I don't know anybody that just wakes up one day and is a brilliant writer. Like it, all the ones, some of my, the best people I know in the business from the screenplays, from a guy like Alan Loeb who wrote Collateral Beauty, is an amazing screenplay writer. Uh, my friend Kamal Ravikant, who a great writer and an inspiration behind Mastering Fear. Um, they've all like written for years and years and years. It's not like they've just all of a sudden, you know, had success. I look at some of my stuff that I wrote for magazines and, and some of the blog posts and I'm just like, oh God, <laughs> I can't go away. But I just recognize that, okay, that was, it's kind of neat. Cause I'm like, oh, I, I was kind of like putting it out there, you know? And, and it, it's just, you gotta do that. You gotta like put it out there. And I think blogging especially is a great format. Even if you have an audience of one, <laughs> if you're just yourself or your friends, if you blog every day, it's like journaling. You just get better and better and better. And um, yeah, I'm thankful my mom made me and my sister journal as kids. Uh, but uh, anyway, that would be the advice: practice and go out there and don't put yourself out there. And, and then realize, you know, take classes, listen to podcasts, read books. Just constantly. I mean, I'm I'm always in a state of self improvement. And it's, I'll tell you this, it's easy to get arrogant. Um, I'm in a, y, a group called YPO. It's the uh, Young Presidents Organization. <clears throat> and, you know, my business was scaling. We had a year we grew 300%. And my YPO group hosted this mini Harvard University. And I had this, like, prejudice. I'm like, what the hell are these Harvard MBA professors going to tell me about business, right? Like, I've been through it all. I've lost it. I've built it back. Um, and they blew my mind. I went through this week. I was like, what an arrogant, arrogant prick I was to, to really like, it, it just proved to myself. I'm like, okay, you got to reset. Because I learned so much in that one week course that I actually, I signed up for their um, business owner MBA program. I, I started in May. Because um, I was just like, okay, I got to go. I need to go. I don't know at all. <laughs> I need to go learn some more. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Brendan. Sure. I really appreciate it. And thanks for being on the Writing Gym podcast. Thanks for having me. If you like what you've heard and are interested to see if you're the right fit for the Writing Gym, here's what to do next. Head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now and book an appointment to speak with our team. Here's how it works. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes and we'll get crystal clear on three things. The best way for you to publish, the best way to achieve your publishing dream, and the exact strategy you should be using to reach your publishing goals. Remember, publishing a book well doesn't happen on its own. You need expert guidance to make it happen. We've helped writers all over the world to finish, publish, and sell their novels well all while sharing their unique story and making the world a better place along the way. To see if we can help you do the same, head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now. I'm Andy Brixey, personal trainer over in the writing gym, and we'll talk soon. Happy writing. Hey there, writer and muse dater. Since you listened all the way to the end, here's this week's quirk of the week. It's kind of like a blooper reel, but not. I don't want to be a rat, but Annalisa can't wink. Why don't you ask her the next time you see her? Thank you so much for joining us here on the Writing Gym Podcast. Happy writing.